Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip, and I am a software engineer here at Google working on educational tools. And today I'm going to talk about uh, one of my open source projects, which is called the Online Python Tutor. And it's a way to visualize uh, what your programs do when they execute, so teachers and students can use it to help understand uh, their programs. So before I get into Online Python Tutor, I want to talk about how programming is currently taught, basic programming. So um, when I was back when I was a grad student, I uh, taught Python and other programming classes um, to people uh, both in school and outside for fun. And usually what you do when you teach the basics of programming is you draw out some code and then you run through it manually and show what happens. So an example here is you write code like you know, x equals 1, 2, 3. So x is a Python list and then y equals x and then uh, x dot append 4. Right. So uh, when you're teaching intro programming, you will ask the students uh, to kind of trace through this program and say, what happens at this step, what happens at this step, what happens at this step? And um, you'll end up drawing diagrams like the following. Right. So the first line executes, and you draw a diagram like x points to some object that's a list of 1, 2, 3. And then the second line that executes this is what trips up a lot of beginners coming to a new programming to languages. You know, what does y equals x mean? And in Python, y equals x means um, you have a variable y, and it points to the same thing that x points to. So once you have the visualization, it's pretty clear what's going on. And then the third line that executes here is x.append4. So append is a method um, in the Python Center library that um, adds a new element to the end of a list. So here, what happens is um, pretty clear, right? So you have x, you follow the arrow to this object, and you put 4 to the end. So you're going to put a new element 4 to the end here. So then later on, if the teacher asks the student, what is the value of y now? y is just follows here. y actually has four elements, and so does x, because of the same object. So in the process of teaching programming, people draw these sorts of diagrams manually all the time. So Every programming teacher and student has drawn countless numbers of the diagrams. So a few years ago, I thought, hmm, the web technologies now are getting good enough that perhaps we could do this all online automatically so that people don't have to manually draw all these diagrams out. So I'm going to show a demo of Online Python Tutor right now by sharing my screen with you. And let's go to um, this one. OK, so this is a basic interface in Online Python Tutor. It's just a, um, it's a console on the web browser at pythontutor.com. And you visit that web page, and then you can write out, this is the exact same code I wrote before. Right? So x equals 1, 2, 3, y equals x, x append 4. And you write your Python code, you hit visualize execution, and then it brings you to this, con it brings you to this interface. So the left side shows the code, and the red arrow shows what line is about to execute. And the right side shows what objects are available. So when you step forward and you execute the first line, you see that there's a global variable x, which has an arrow that points to a list of 1, 2, 3. And this is exactly what I drew on the, on the whiteboard. And when you execute the second line, it draws another variable y and points it to the same 1, 2, 3. And when you execute the third line, the program finishes and it appends 4 to that list. So using this interface, you could write arbitrary Python code. So there's examples that are that are a bit more involved. You can imagine a longer example here with more operations. Hit visualize, and then um, using online Python tutor, you can actually scrub through the execution of the code to see what happens as you execute it. And you can also go backwards as well to see what happens. So you can kind of go forwards and backwards through your program. And this one way to think about this uh, is as a metaphor is a virtual whiteboard. So you can imagine um, sharing your screen. Uh, while you're teaching, and if you're teaching a lecture setting, for example, you can project this onto your lecture hall. If you're tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, you can project this on a laptop or even actually a tablet. So it works on multiple form factors. So this is a very basic site. So the site is called pythontutor.com. You can just visit it, and you can um, play with these visualizations. And moreover, what you can do is, since it's, everything is on the web in regular web pages, you can embed these visualizations into your own material. So here's a web page. This is the home page. And I've actually just embedded a visualization in the home page itself. So this is a recursive list summing function. You can look over this offline to see what it does. 
And I can step through this as a live visualization, and there's just text above and below it. Um, and you can imagine embedding this in a digital textbook or in lecture notes or even in quizzes, for example, on the web. So that's pythontutor.com in a nutshell. And now I'm going to go over to, let's see. Now I'm going to um, introduce our very special guest, John, um, who will introduce himself. Hi, John. Hi, Philip. So uh, Philip asked me to come during this hangout because I am an avid user of the online Python tutor and a huge fan. So uh, I teach an introductory computer science course at the University of California, Berkeley. And for many years, this course has drawn what we call environment diagrams, which are exactly the sort of thing that Philip just described. And, uh, you know, drawing an environment diagram is an important way to help visualize the state of a computer interpreter as people are learning how to program. And it's really the answer to the question, why doesn't my code work? Is that we always want to just draw the environment diagram and say, well, this is actually what's happening. And I drew them by hand for many years, and that was always frustrating because people would ask, um, you know, how do I draw it for this example? How do I draw it for the next example? And that's why I realized that online Python Tutor is an awesome solution to just have these things automatically drawn. So, so that's how I got involved. Cool, cool. Um, so, so you first ended up drawing the stuff by hand. And then I think, if I remember, you actually did some kind of computer drawing for Python Tutor. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. So um, I lecture to a large group of students. And uh, I do so with prepared materials that are just slides. And in my slides, I wanted these diagrams, so that I ended up drawing them using just basic drawing tools. And uh, that was tedious, and every time I decided I wanted to make a change, then I'd have to redraw my entire diagram. But I did that a lot because, you know, I thought it was worthwhile. Um, so that's where I started, and I realized, you know, I, I wasn't the only one who could be drawing these diagrams, and uh, then I found your, your program to help me out. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, so... Um, do you want to do you want to just talk briefly about? Uh, do you, I think you have yeah, something you can share your screen briefly and just talk about how you're actually using it in the class? Because I talked a little bit about embedding just now. So yours is a great example of embedding online Python tutor within class materials. Yeah, so there's kind of a chronology to this, in that uh, I started out drawing my own diagrams kind of by hand or on the computer, but with drawing tools and pointing my students to the original version of online Python tutor, which you had created what was it, two years ago? Uh, and so um, then I was hoping that perhaps we could just replace all those diagrams. And where do those diagrams show up? Well, I've drawn them by hand on the board. I've put them in my slides. And then I've also developed a set of lecture notes for the course that are supposed to just explicitly walk through all of the material and introduce the concepts. And those have the same diagrams in them. Uh, so uh, what happens now? is that when I'm developing my lecture notes, I just type in the Python code for the example that I want to illustrate right in the middle of my lecture notes, and the appropriate diagram appears. So let me press some buttons, see if I can share my screen, and uh, show you what that looks like in the context of my class at Berkeley. Coming up, I promise. Yeah, so you guys, uh, if you're tuning in online, you can make comments directly on the uh, on the comment thread, and we'll be monitoring those as 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 we are trying to chat and converse. Uh, how's that look, Philip? Can you see my demo? Okay. So the story is that rather than using a textbook, we use a set of online lecture notes which are more or less like a textbook in the sense that they have full paragraphs describing the material for the course and give in-context examples. Uh, but now we also embed the online Python tutor. Uh, in the course, we call them environment diagrams. So that's how we see environment diagrams right there. But the nice thing about this is that instead of a static image, here embedded in the lecture notes for the course, we can uh, highlight, for instance, all of the different arrows that point to a particular object in this case, a recursive list structure that we've constructed with this block of code. 
And then we can also step through exactly what happens. So in this case, we're trying to get an item at index 1 out of a recursive list that starts out at index 0. And we do that by calling a function that gets the rest of the list and then getting the first item of the rest of that list. So this is a computational process that shows up often in, uh, in the course. And it's the kind of thing that's just much easier to understand if you can look at a picture of it. And that's exactly what you see here. And then, can I just keep rambling? I'll keep rambling. Uh, the, the, the other nice thing that I love about embedding this in the lecture notes, as opposed to having a static image, is that we added this button, Edit Code, where students can investigate the question they always have, what happens if I change this? Or what happens if I change that? So they can press Edit Code. That brings them to the main online Python Tutor site, but we've filled in already for them exactly the example that they were looking at before. So if they have some question that says, well, what happens if I have something more complicated here uh, instead of what I was there before? What happens now? They can visualize that process. And right away, they're stepping through their program. And they can see exactly what changed relative to what was there before, which is pretty cool. That's kind of how textbooks should work, I think. Yeah, this is, this is super awesome. So just a bit of context here. Um, John, John also works at Google. As a, as a research scientist. And he, uh, he and I have been staying up uh, many days and nights getting this to work for the past, uh, for the past few weeks, I guess, because we, uh, so the class started in the beginning of September. And for the month and a half before that, we had this really good back and forth because he was my main power user. And uh, he, would, he would basically send me successive bits of code that were harder and more trickier to process. And then I would have to try to make Python 2 to work pretty well for it. And, and it was like a very good iterative back and forth process. So I guess you could talk a little bit about what's, what are the tricky, weird things that we had to, uh, to do to make it work for your class's needs. Yeah, so we cover a lot of ground in the class. It's an introductory computer science class, but usually not students' first introduction to programming. Typically, it's their first introduction to really mind-bending and interesting ideas in programming. So we do things like higher order functions, and anonymous functions. And these are things that uh, not every Python user typically uses, but are very useful features of the language. And they make for uh, very concise and modular programs. So they're important to teach. But exactly how they interact with each other in a, in a program can be uh, tricky to sort out. And so not only are these things challenging to students, but they were a little bit challenging for us to get right in the online Python tutor as well. But now we've really covered all the cases, I think, of exactly all the different interactions that can happen in a Python program, where you're creating functions on the fly, calling them. Those were created in the context of other functions. We need to get, uh, for instance, the lexical scoping rules of the language right and all of that. And um, you know, I couldn't use it in my class until it was really right. Uh, so that's why I'm very thankful to Philip for working with me to, to kind of get all the features into the tutor that would make it a useful tool for the class. Cool. Yeah, so I'm going to share, uh, since John mentioned I'm going to share an example that's a especially crazy one. Uh, this, uh, this one is called, uh, if you go to the pythontutor.com site, you can click on the student torture example. I have all these test cases. And this is one late at night, John sent me this example. He's like, this isn't working. And I'm like, who writes code like this? <laughs> but it needs to work for his class. So Python Tutor works on Python 2 and 3. So this one uses a special non-local keyword. So it's only Python 3. So I choose Python 3. I visualize. And I won't go over it in detail, obviously. It would take a whole lot of time. But this actually does the right thing. It has these higher order functions with lambdas. And the arrows are just all over the place. And you know, there, there is an intrinsic messiness to this. And it's because the you know this structure with the scoping and the, the environment labels and stuff is inherently messy. So before Python Tutor, someone would have to, some poor TA would have to draw out all these things by hand and perhaps make mistakes while drawing it along the way. So um, this, this has been, you know, these sorts of cases have been really good at showcasing the, the power of the tool. Yeah, and I, I think another fun part, a consequence of building this tool with, well, Philip building this tool, and I've been helping a little bit uh, to make sure it does what it's supposed to do is that we've had to investigate exactly what we can understand about the inner workings of Python, how it keeps track of all of this information so that we can expose it to the user. And um, 
and uh, yeah, so we've learned some things along the way, and I think it's all for the sake of helping other students learn as well. Awesome. That's great. Um, so I guess I'll end briefly by talking about uh, some of the stuff we're, uh, we're doing in, in the near term. And you know, the next thing to do is to, let's see, oh, there we go, we're back. Yeah, so the, the kind of ongoing plan right now is to, we have a basic interface working that does a lot of visualization. And what I'm doing now is building out an authoring environment around that so that people could say, uh, make comments on the code and the visualizations and make lessons and annotations and perhaps in the future make even mini quizzes and activities for students. Because right now there's a really good core kernel technology and it's a matter of um, putting a lot of the, the wrapper around that to make it really usable for more people. So I'd be super happy to answer questions on email or um, just, just find me on Google Plus for, for, um, for this. So anyways, thanks again, John, for, uh, for the, doing the Hangout. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome.